Our next presenter is Associate Professor Carl Huon. Um, sorry, Carl, I've mangled your name. Uh, it's a metabolic biochemist and physiologist. He uh, ha has established a laboratory at the University of Virginia in 2009 and a lab at UNSW in 2014. And he investigates the passive physiology of obesity-related malignancies, including liver cancer and endometrial cancer. It's a pleasure to go. I enjoyed seeing the Cori cycle and uh, the, the lactate to uh, pervert connection between the, the muscle. And then Freddie's talking a little bit about smoking and some of the relationships uh, between uh, correlations between uh, you know smoking and types of cancer. And you know I, we should have coordinated our talks a little bit better because I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, okay, here we go. Um, I'm also using some of the same slides. So, you know, this is from the Lancet study that uh, was just mentioned. But I just want to draw your attention to two types of cancer. The first is uterine cancer. And so you can see here the, the hazard ratio with, in comparison to the body mass index. So as body mass index increases, you get it to about 35, and this goes off the scale. Um, and as for, for all the cancers that were in this paper, this is the number one obesity-related cancer. Uh, and of course, this is in women because um, men don't have a uterus. But if you look over here in liver cancer, you can see that there's a, a big standard deviation spread here. Um, and that's because men uh, are on this side and women are on this side. So women are a little bit more protected than men. Um, but there is a, a definitely a correlation between uh, adiposity and uh, the, the risk of developing these types of cancer. So um, my lab is really trying to tease apart the relationship between obesity and, and cancer. And you know, I think the entire field has been looking at how does obesity increase cancer risk? And you know, I, I'm taking it a step backwards and cross out the how, and you know, I'm trying to figure out, does obesity increase cancer risk? And I'll show you a little bit of data to, to suggest that you know, maybe there's things that it's not really obesity related, but it could be. Uh, you know, it's undoubtedly highly correlated, but um, mechanistically, it's very difficult to uh, pin down the link between obesity and cancer. And so on the one hand, hyperinsulinemia is probably one of the more obvious things that um, people have linked to between obesity and the development of cancer. But you also have hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, uh, anabolic growth hormones, insulin, IGF-1, IGF binding proteins. Uh, as you become overweight, you increase the secretion of adipokines, leptin and adiponectin. Uh, there's a variety of factors that, uh, and a lot of inflammatory factors as well. So here's the, the connection I'll, I'll just draw to the relationship between smoking and the development of lung cancer. Um, so one of the things to notice here is that there's a 20 to 30 year lag period between uh, cigarette consumption and the emergence of the lung cancer in men. Now here, we're on the obesity side of things, this is the increase in obesity rates with time. And if you can't see it in the back, this is 2012 uh, back to 1980. And as these curves have increased, you know, if we have a similar 20 to 30 year lag period, I think we're in a lot of trouble, um, just to reiterate some of the comments from earlier. One of the problems is that you know, smoking is related to lung cancer through a straightforward mechanism involving a carcinogen. We really don't have much idea of how obesity is linked to cancer. And so one of the possibilities is that you know, we have to pay careful attention to the role of diet in cancer because maybe the diet is causing the cancer, but the same diet is also causing obesity. And so um, these are the things I'm trying to tease out in my laboratory. I'm just going to show you evidence from, from one study, a uh, really quick one. We gave mice a single injection of a molecule called dialthonitrosamine at two weeks of age. And this molecule causes liver damage, it causes some oxidative stress and some DNA alkylations that make these animals more at risk of developing liver cancer later in life. And so when we feed these animals a normal, healthy, chow-fed uh, uh, diet, you can see that <clears throat> there's a few um, you know, small tumors in these animals. But now mechanistically, if, or uh, it's again a correlation, but if you supplement that diet with a diet that's more like a cookie dough diet, it's high in sugar, high in fat, you can see that at the same time point of 32 weeks, uh, there's a massive increase in the amount of tumors in both male and female mice. And of course, these mice also become obese. So there's this really strong relationship. And 
we're, we can do things in animals that we, you can't do in humans, obviously. Um, so we can ex very well control the diets. And so in this case, we tease this apart a little bit further. What if we put it in high sugar, but we have low fat, similar as chow diet? And in this case, the animals were still small, not obese, and they had almost the same amount of tumors um, on average as the, uh, as the obese mice fed, fed this diet. And then we did this, the opposite. So uh, we took sugar out of the diet and fed them a high-fat diet. These animals became obese, but there's hardly any tumors detected in these animals. So we've been able to um, uncouple obesity per se uh, with the development of this type of cancer in this model system. OK, so one of the next things we did is we waited until the mice had tumors. And so these mice are just fed a, a normal chow diet. Um, and then we came in and we fed them a diet that had the high fat but the very low sugar diet and to see if we could uh, change the, um, <clears throat> the growth of these tumors over time. So now we've taken sugar away from the diet. And what we found was, um, and a lot of times, this is a ketogenic diet, so ketones do go up. And so you, one of the more common diets, if you pick up a cancer nutrition book, you'll see a lot, of, uh, a lot about ketone, uh, ketogenic diets. It's just a word of caution that, at least in animals, um, when we fed them this low-sugar ketogenic diet, um, more animals popped up more tumors over time, over this inter interval, um, than just when they're fed the normal, normal uh, standard chow diet. So I think coming back to this, um, at least in this mouse model that we were studying, dietary sugar is really a powerful driver of liver tumor genesis. Uh, obesity, per se, is not sufficient to drive tumor genesis because we had those mice fed the ketogenic diet that were really fat, um, that still, uh, sorry, uh, that, didn't, that were resistant to developing tumors in this model. Um, and then we found that sugar restriction can decrease uh, tumor initiation, but once there's tumors already established, uh, it, was, it was not easy to uh, reverse that. Um, and so this comes back to uh, there's a strong note for prevention is probably the best medicine in this case. Um, with that, there's a few people just like to think that did the work in the lab and some planning from NHMRC. Thank you.